so the topic wa is free, uh, failure preemption and corrosion failures so what is failure failure or corrosion corrosion failures is termination or ability of a component uh, which is not able to uh, perform its intended purpose or the function or it is something like a loss of containment or the fluid the failure could be because of corrosion it could be erosion or cracking and uh, it could be electrochemical mechanical or uh, combination of both uh not uh, it uh, it should be noted that failure necessarily uh, need is uh, not equivalent to leak the the corrosion itself like the thinning of a section can also lead to loss of uh, its functionality and that is a failure and it is not really a leak these are some of the depictions like this is a leak wherein you can see there is a loss of containment the steam coming out of the uh, uh, piping and the near the flange and other photograph shows the thinning of the section now when we say corrosion failures why corrosion failures are so important because it is linked to the cost and the uh, corrosion corrosion management what we have been uh, speaking since morning uh, it is linked to a cost and fi finally everything boils down to cost the cor when we say at corrosion cost uh, it uh, there are uh, 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 the cost can be uh, divided into two like before uh, the actual failure takes place and the post failure cost now post failure cost if you can see it is listed here it is lost of hydrocarbon the deferred production repair and the labor cost logistic cost environmental cost and more than that the reputation cost uh, which is uh, uh, and the uh, legal and the fines and all that whereas the pre failure cost which are very much in our control and it can be controlled and uh, by a process uh, called as preemption of the failures it has two components into it it is corrosion based uh, corrosion engineering based cost and a non corrosion engineering based so this all encompasses Uh, the corrosion management so when in a uh, operational plant corrosion management is in place it becomes very easy or it is more uh, uh, facilitating to have uh, corrosion failure preemptions so when coming to corrosion ba engineering based cause uh, this starts from the design stage like uh, we have to see look at it uh, that there is a free draining uh, tank which is designed there are no crevices or gaps so the weld has to be uh, seamless uh then when it comes to material selection based on the environment uh, uh, which is there in the containment we can go ahead with the material selection like it could be carbon steel and uh, when where the cost is constant then we go ahead with a corrosion rate calculation uh, and then we have a corrosion allowance over and above that and uh, we have to of course consider corrosion control cost also at point of design only like we should know the operating parameters uh, what will be the ph what are the corrosive elements into the process fluid and if not then we have to consider carbon steel for example with corrosion allowance and over and above that we have to see to it that uh, we can have additional uh, corrosion control measures such as corrosion inhibitors and other uh, uh, elements like the scale inhibitors biocide when it comes to offshore pipelines for uh, crude uh, or uh, petroleum transportation then corrosion cost for uh, as a non corrosion engineering measure if you look at uh, this is this comes under uh, corrosion management here it involves inspection cost and these are really very um, cumbersome and uh, it calls for like a real uh, good cost which can be controlled if we have proper design in place so uh, that's done at the engineering uh, phase then uh, it also has a uh, corrosion monitoring like in morning also it was discussed uh, so it if it is measured then only we can control it so corrosion monitoring has to be in place the management of all encompasses of the various strategies policies and uh, the database and it is more of a documentation there are uh, reviews uh, follow up reviews the competencies and the communication which is uh, involved in the management part of it and uh, the uh, there is a follow up like when the failure is likely and known we have to carry out a failure risk assessment something like a risk based uh, uh, inspection which do we do at a design phase similarly if uh, we can do but it's a costly affair and it thing is it has to be done so that uh, intention has to be there and uh, as earlier also i showed the uh, post failure corrosion cost includes a loss of hydrocarbon repairs so the overall performance and efficiency is lost so corrosion failures need to be kept minimum corrosion management uh, concept and the cost of, i said uh, they are like interlinked so both um, of this has corrosion engineering uh, management and corrosion non corrosion engineering based um, uh, mode so uh, to have the more uh, extent and effectiveness this measures cannot be compromised so we have to take care of both the non ce as well as ce based cost and we have to uh, the inputs given to the corrosion en engineers Uh, will lead to minimizing the uh, cost 
of failure by preempting the uh, corrosion failures. So uh, as earlier also said, if uh, corrosion management is in place, then the corrosion concepts what are there will lead to uh, pre uh, pre adequate uh, failure preemptions. So preventing failure, uh, corrosion failures would uh, indirectly like eliminate post failure cost and thus overall cost will be reduced. Now coming to uh, preemption, what, what does it do? Preemption has two components again, it's prediction and prevention. Prediction is uh, when you have, I'll come to it in details, like when, where and how it can uh, occur and the prevention is how do you mitigate it uh, by uh, uh, pre preventive measures and uh, it could be by repair or replacement action. So uh, we can ensure that the uptime of the plant is more and the shutdowns are uh, decreased, thereby the overall uh, failures are uh, minimized and the uh, costs are optimized. So benefit of the corrosion management is a spin-off benefit that we have corrosion uh, failure preemptions. So we identify, we can predictively identify it or it could be uh, preventive. Uh, prediction is where, when and how the failure will occur and the preventive is by rem taking uh, remedial actions or uh, preventing the failure before it happens. Uh, and then uh, there are uh, other parameters to corrosion management which I'll uh, talk to you later. So prediction, again, uh, uh, prediction is something like uh, you uh, foresee it where, how, when, uh, how it will, uh, where it will happen. Whereas prevention is, uh, we can literally prevent the corrosion measures knowing the, uh, or taking a preactive, uh, proactive uh, remedial actions or replacements and prolong the life till the next shutdown or turnaround is taken. So we ha get to have like uh, enough time till the next turnaround and the appropriate corrosion management will be in place. So prediction is to foresee where, when, and how the failure will occur. The uh, the determination and uh, for that, what do we need to know? All this is based on totally data. Like we need to have uh, what alloy system or the corrosion loops are to be developed at the design stage itself. If not, then uh, there is no, I mean, still time that we should have all these uh, details available. Then what are the prevailing conditions and the preempting conditions? Then what are the possible deteriorations uh, it's uh, observation identification and the past history, the recurrences, all these are required to predict the corrosions. Then uh, when uh, it is to be predicted, then we need to carry out a failure risk assessment as earlier also I said, and the corrosion zone is identified. So uh, how do we get to know where the corrosion or where it is go exactly going to happen? Then we uh, uh, go ahead, uh, like uh, we get into the sectionalization and uh, drill down uh, where it will happen, like certain things uh, uh, in corrosion are known. Wherever there are dead legs, MIC will occur. So that is the area where it is likely to happen, right? So RBI also takes uh, such uh, uh, features in consideration. And when it is going to happen, here uh, we need to have uh, the corrosion monitoring inspection data. And exactly like we can predict where uh, corrosion, uh, sorry, when it will occur. Uh, then here are all the corrosive species uh, the, I mean the corrosion rate can be determined and that is how we can predict when the corrosion will happen. And how? Because uh, we as a corrosion engineer, this comes as a component of uh, CE. So we know like uh, there is a uh, combination or couple for say uh, stress corrosion to cr uh, cr occur, chloride should be present uh, for stainless steel. So wherever there is chloride and uh, we know it's a stainless steel and the uh, temperature approaches above 60 degree, the likelihood of SCC is there. So th that is how we will uh, get to know that it will be, uh, uh, the failure will be in form of a cracking. Similarly, when there is a thickness and uh, there are elbows, then those are the susceptible zones where thinning will occur and it will lead to the final failure. So that is how the prediction can be done. When it comes to uh, prevention uh, more, uh, prevention is nothing that uh, we have to delay the onset of corrosion, the incumbent uh, incumbent of the uh, corrosion. So it can be done uh, by inspection method, we identify those things. Either it should be repaired or replaced. Uh, the method what we are in, uh, industry, in industry we adopt is by clamping or wrapping and all, or removing or replacement of the entire pet. And uh, yeah, so that is what, so we need to take some remedial action before the uh, failure occurs and it, the, it is prolonged till the next uh, uh, turnaround is to happen. And the, um, recently, like uh, our prosim uh, uh, friend also said, FFS has to be carried out. And we can uh, get to know if it is really required 
uh, to be uh, replaced it has to be replaced so once the integrity management decides and it is determined for action there is no uh, uh, second thought for it and it has to be replaced that is how we can uh, enable the post failure cost uh, then the remedial action uh, other than uh, the immediate uh, action that we take on the site we can uh, improve improvise upon the chemical treatment then the certain things like improve the uh, like operate above the dew point so whatever is co controllable from process point of view has to be done in order to take care then uh, in case of piping when there is a clogging and all that the cleaning pigs have to be carried out like we uh, earlier in the morning we saw uh, the cleaning pigs are done so such steps can be carried out so then in certain case ammonium uh, chloride type of corrosion happens then we should uh, go ahead with a water wash intermediate water wash so that we can uh, save on the time these are certain photographs uh, that we worked on the failure analysis uh, various types like you can see it's a pitting uh, then there is a non uniform there is a thinning here there is a then there there's a rupture down there then this is a mechanical failure because of the uh, fatigue uh, yeah and certain uh, manufacturing defects are also there which will uh, in long run in operations will fail so uh, there are critical factors uh, uh, i mean i will also come to why we should do failure analysis and why should we have yeah i'm done almost so these three parameters are very important for uh, uh, prediction and prevention or rather preemption of the failure uh, failure uh, corrosion failures one is proper data management which i have been saying that the proper data has to be relevant data has to be there the design process operating inspection there uh, uh, it, and that to be it, it has to be uh, at right time timely uh, uh, data management has to be done there has to be adequate communication uh, it, between the corrosion engineer operator and the process of course and there has to be adequate competency because one has to understand that and it is not competency related to one person it has to be mix of education training experience supervision uh, the person in charge should have knowledge there has to be proper moc like when there is a shift change he has to hand over and say these are the points critical points when there is a uh, uh, change in the shift he has to uh, convey that person like what all should be done and not to be done so data management includes design operation process inspection pigging all all these things and uh, when it comes to communication communication it's not a one way it has to be effective and um, efficient from both the ways uh, and when it comes to asset integrity management for corrosion engineer all these things have to be there uh, in a precise and a uh, consolidated way to give up better uh, remedial measures when it comes to preemption of uh, failures so uh, competency as i mentioned the education training experiences of uh, importance so failure uh, analysis i'll maybe i'll skip this maybe <laughs> and this is a leak register data and we intend to have this database like uh, earlier in the morning also the, uh, we were saying there has to be data management so the various failures happen no failure is unique in its sense as such but then in case we have this database we'll get to know and the preemption will be more uh, appropriate i would say so that is also i think that is uh, from my side so we are we in operating plant actually look at reliability and profitability point of view so uh, we this there, it is a integrated approach basically and these are the pillars of the this thing so with this i would like to thank you all thank you thank you very much thank you Th that was a pretty condensed presentation uh, i'm afraid you know we we are <laughs> running out of time so i'd like to apologize to uh, <coughs> deepashree that I, i won't allow questions at this time if you don't mind we c you can carry them over to the tea break <coughs> i had a couple myself so maybe i'll be able to do that <coughs> uh i'd like to invite the next speaker uh dr deepak gangal from uh, shell technology center in bangalore and he will uh, be talking about the life cycle approach to managing corrosion and impact in offshore production facilities thank you sir thank you so good afternoon everyone i hope uh, all of you are well awake 
because even though we had very nice food but we have had a very hectic pace of giving information to you so i'm going to do some more of it uh, please uh, excuse me if it is too much but uh, my presentation is a little light on data and mathematics it is more around how we behave so as you say our topic of this uh, gathering is to managing corrosion impact on asset integrity and uh, there can be a lot of number crunching lot of theories around that but at the top of it what we want that nothing should leak which is unacceptable to us nothing should leak that is making an assets unsafe bringing bad reputation to the operator and big actually bringing harm to the community around the asset as you say this is a picture of one of our offshore assets that got uh, recently installed in gulf of mexico uh, for the deep water oil production and this is just there for you to get a flavor that we'll be talking about underwater above water but quite far away from the shore because it is offshore yeah so typical offshore production facilities include subsea wells because wells are on the seabed and in the shallow uh, water uh, the wells are connected so half of the well hardware is on the seabed another half is on the platform and if it is a real deep sea uh, design deep water design uh, the whole well is on the, the seabed and you only have flow lines going to the top sides then you have subsea structures uh, that house all the wells and the pipeline and terminals etc you have top sides process platforms subsea umbilicals risers and pipelines so that basically connect the top sides to the what is happening on the seabed and lastly you have subsea controls and safety hardware which is very very important to keep the production and assets safe for operations now the topic of my presentation is that life cycle approach what is life cycle approach so it's very much you can relate it to the life of humans itself you know like before we we are born somebody prepares us to be born and then when we are born we go through multiple stages so what we have here is basically first phase which is on the blue at the top is design and material selection second one is that procurement construction and installation third one is preservation commissioning and operation fourth one is monitoring maintenance and repair and the last one is either rejuvenation that you extend the life make some big modification or you decide to abandon abandon that particular assets so these are the five important life stages so they can be written in seven they can be written in three but by and large this is what it is and when we say life cycle approach so we will talk about what should one focus as the part of the asset design operation maintenance team or any other responsibility in the different life stages where they are performing the role before we go into the different life stages just to set the scene so there are some very special challenges in managing corrosion impact in offshore facilities and uh, what are they that when you are designing or maybe let me give you a flavor when somebody says oh we have discovered lot of gas in mozambique offshore do you know when will you get the first gas molecule from that facility how long it will take when somebody says oh i have so many trillion cubic meters sitting under the ground any idea no idea so typically it will be anywhere between 8 years to 20 years i have worked in project where it has taken more than 20 years to set get the first molecule of oil out of the ground it was in kazakhstan and you can imagine that you declare okay i have so many whatever uh, billion barrels of oil under the ground but when will they come out and then uh, it takes such a long time so you can see when the design happens to the time it operates probably the whole generation of people are gone maybe their kids are operating the plant that they designed and so easily it is very long time and lot of uncertainty is there there can be an exploration well that tells you okay it's this much co2 h2s water chloride etc will come out but when you actually start to produce very different things can happen and while you are going to through the construction phase more wells are getting drilled more data is coming in and the design has to be updated sometime possible to update sometime not possible to update and that is the first challenge and how do 
materials and corrosion engineers deal with it that they do run sensitivity checks okay i am giving a standard design how much uh, variation it can take and where i have to put a hard stop that if it goes so much chlorides higher than this temperature so much higher than this flow so much higher than this sand so much higher than this then there will be a big impact because we will either change the material or the size or whatever yeah second one is that the properties of the produced fluid partly i covered but what happens is that when you put an offshore asset which is definitely minimum 1 billion dollar or maybe more than that it's a big asset so you can design it for 20 years but very likely when your field is depleted you will let other people to connect their wells to your field and flow to somewhere else so the asset has to operate with condition for which it wasn't even designed but for company to make money they have to do that so that is the second thing that we also have to have sensitivity around it third one is that uh, there is significant years between different component going there wells drilling can happen much earlier and the platform or the top sites can come probably 8 years after that pipeline may be delayed or sometimes you will see that pipelines were installed because they are very easy to install you order steel it comes you have barges you install it but the top sites or the other areas or sometimes drilling is so difficult there can be years and years of uh, period uh, before everything is uh, put in one chain for you to get the molecule out of the ground and this is a big uncertainty where we have seen uh, costly and uh, subsea pipelines corroding because nobody maintained them for how to drain the hydro test water out of it so the life cycle approach is all about it that whatever is the team at that point in time they have to see in what life the asset will go through and prepare mitigation yeah so focus areas in the design and material selection phase is that you have to have tools that so that you can model corrosion like co2 h2s corrosion or if you have uh, organic acids how do you manage that if you have to do corrosion inhibitor or other chemical how do you manage that so all that has to be a comprehensive model we know the model that we use today are far more advanced than they were 10 years back there will be model which will be far more advanced 5 10 years from now than what you are using currently so as a corrosion engineers we have to be up to date with the corrosion modeling technology second point is of course the sensitivity analysis that how much variations your design can take and lastly there is importance to putting redundancies so today you design you say okay i don't need corrosion inhibitor but there's no harm in putting a provision for injecting corrosion inhibitor in the pipeline you should do that or a wax inhibitor or a scale inhibitor so that makes a design robust so that Te five years down the line, when hazop happens, and then somebody realizes that, oh, I want to put this chemical in, so you should have a provision in the design for that. <coughs> Next one, big areas, construction and installation phase. So as I mentioned, that there can be gaps of years, long periods between one system getting ready ahead of the other. That has to be factored in here. Secondly, you ordered big uh, raw material, particularly the pipeline line pipes. how are they being treated once they are been produced and coated at the mill most likely most project make arrangements to receive them like what we call as fob fret on board it's your responsibility right from the factory out of china to take it to australia where you want to put it may take probably about a year and what all it will see during that time it is the also important for corrosion guys to know and have a say on how it will be preserved or how it will be monitored during that period second one is that many times we see that most of the subsea hardware where you have wells you have pipeline and terminals we give them temporary cathodic protection thinking that okay after 3 years when the jacket comes we'll hook up it to the main sacrificial anode system maybe that thing is delayed by 5 6 years then what is the remedy once you have placed something uh, 600 meters on the deep sea so all those have to be factored in and it is all about realizing that in offshore logistics is a big challenge when something has gone in the place nobody wants to put another uh, uh, man hour or another machinery to take care of it yeah in operations and uh, maintenance i heard something about risk based inspection you mentioned i think it is a very important part in shell that we take it like the way corrosion engineer should live this their career is all about risk based inspection 
And when we say risk-based inspection, it is not only about inspection. If some of you who are familiar with the methodology, it is not to be done only at the design stage. Design stage is where it takes form of a baby, but it really matures and remains with the asset till it is either abandoned or rejuvenated. So in risk-based inspection, first and foremost, what we do is that uh, we decide what are the operating windows so that we tell operations this is your uh, range in which you should operate and then we decide when we will inspect based on the risk of not inspecting and having a failure and once we say risk-based inspection schedules have been generated then it has to be the top operating officer of the company who has to say okay i will allow you delay in inspection because either i have no money or i have production targets or i have some other constraint so for us risk-based inspection is what a corrosion engineer does all through the life of the asset and how he does it he does it as a part of a nominated multidisciplinary team that is there right from the beginning of the project in the design phase, people change, but the team continues. And it is always a multidisciplinary decision so that it isn't about getting an email, it is about meeting once every month or more frequently as required. Yeah. In rejuvenation and major modification phase, of course, uh, now that we are close to the end of the life, and uh, this is where you can bring in new technology as it comes in today our corrosion sensors are much more advanced so what you see below is a lamp wave propagation based corrosion monitoring happening over the big surface compared to a point thickness measurement and all that we can bring in lastly in the abandonment when you have to lift a platform what you see in the picture is one of our brent platforms in the north sea brent is one of the benchmark crude but it doesn't produce anymore because it is depleted so this is where a platform is being removed and then that is also important part where integrity has to be take, checked in because you don't want it to fall over before you lift it and put it on the barges to move so in summary this is what life cycle is all about it what you do you think about how is it going to impact the integrity? How is it going to affect the corrosion? And take action. And lastly, all actions basically in shell are driven by risk-based inspection methodology, which takes birth at the time of design and then lives till the rejuvenation or modification. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. How many minutes I took? <laughs> well, we are within, we are squeezed, but we are okay. Okay. Um, but if, if you don't mind, no question. We have uh, two more speakers. Yeah, yeah, please. And uh, tea is growing cold, you know, okay. which is not a good thing. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for your. So th thank you very much, <laughs> Professor Lakshmanan. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so fr uh, Professor Lakshmanan is from uh, IIT Ma Madras, and he's going to talk about smart composite coatings for corrosion protection. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, no? yeah. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, Thank you, sir, for the introduction. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for providing me this opportunity. I don't think I'll use the mic, mic. I'll just say loudly. Thank you for the opportunity, providing me this opportunity to be here and provide a talk on what we do in our laboratory. Today, I would, I would title the talk as Smart Composite Coatings for Corrosion Protection. This is a picture of our laboratory at IIT Madras. Uh, I named the group as uh, Corrosion Engineering and Materials Electrochemistry Group. If you look at what we do as a research overview, we keep electrochemistry as the center heart of it, and we work on using electrochemistry to understand corrosion, corrosion engineering. We use also electrochemistry to produce materials electrochemistry for various functional applications. We also use microelectrochemistry and mechanoelectrochemistry, which is combination of electrochemistry in micron levels, also bringing into mechanical testing plus corrosion, and we also use as a surface engineering tool. Today I'm designed my talk on particular aspect of corrosion where we try to develop a smart composite coating. We all are aware about corrosion prevention method and one such method is coating. A typical conventional coating as multi-layer with multiple functions. You have zinc primers, you have then the top coat which should resist UV, it should resist wear, etc. and it should be hydrophobic. But today what we look at, we replace this multi-level, multi-stack coatings into a simple one which is called as a smart coating. It should have what is have in primer, intermediate, as well as on a top coat. So how do we look at it? When we looked at it, what we do, we wanted to develop one which is sustained, and it should be releasing or preventing it over a period of time. So we took the concept from what people use in bio, which is called as a drug release studies. 
this is a rat where you have a certain part at which the drug has to be released. You take this drug, put it into the capsule and insert into the body and it just releases at the location on demand required based on what is the trigger. The trigger could be ultrasound, magnetic, UV light, electrical or thermal. But can I have this parallel system for a coating system if I can take a container, which again you can have this drug as a reservoir, a capsule which is then released from the reservoir or take the matrix where the drug is there and then you dissolve the matrix. So what we try to do now is take this concept of on-demand release in bio for the corrosion inhibitors, which you will have a container which is placed with the corrosion inhibitors. So is it possible to trigger that? We have by means in atmospheric corrosion, we always learn that when there is a reduction reaction at the site, you will have the pH moving towards basicity. So pH can be one triggering point by which you can release these inhibitors. And finally, it can arrest the corrosive attack and self heal the corrosion front. And this is not only just releasing, it should be sustained over a period of time. Is it possible? That's what we wanted to try. So what was, this would give us some kind of a picture here. You see a cr scratch and there should be particles or pigments which can have these inhibitors and when there is a crack progression or a corrosion front, it should release and inhibit the corrosion front. So what is our strategy? We started with building up of containers. We found out that silica, mesoporous silica could be a possible container. And once we have mesoporous silica, we identified certain set of inhibitors, which then can be put inside it. And then you cannot just put it inside and put it into a coating because it will release immediately. It has to release at that point of trigger. So we try to encapsulate it. And once you encapsulate it, when there is a local front where pH changes, it gets released. And then you can take this capsule you can put it into a metallic coating if you want, or you can put it into a polymeric coating based on what you want to do. And finally, you can understand the corrosion behavior and how does this perform. So this is our strategy for our smart coating. How do we go about it? It's simple colloidal chemistry, where you prepare SBA. SBA stands for Santa Barbara C15, which is a mesoporous silica, which has a certain dimensions, which is used to Stauber, used produced by Stauber method process. So finally, once you get the particle, how does it look? This is how it looks. It's basically cylindrical. Approximately 15 micrometers is its length. And if you look, we have, what we have done is the first is as received particle, as produced particle. And then we try to mix it with BTA, which is benzotriazole, one of the well-known inhibitor. And then we covered the benzotriol with a polymer, which is actually in action when the pH goes towards 11. So after that, we see that it's more or less the same. So why mesoporous material? You have a lot of pores which can occupy large volume of inhibitors inside it. So this is your TEM image which shows the pore dimensions is approximately 5 to 7 nanometers. Is it right? So we did also the porosity studies using adsorption isotherms. And BET and BJH technique gave us that it's more or less the same. When you have SBA, you have approximately the surface area 514.2 millimeter squared per gram, and as you modify it, your, your area tends to reduce, which says that possibly we have incorporated them inside it. And once we know we put in the inhibitors, we also checked whether the inhibitors are available. We performed XPS characterization to prove that the molecules which are in are present in. And then we tried to see, does it release first of all? So we tested release studies using UVVIS. The left image is something for pH 7, which basically you see the bottom one, at pH 7, when you are encapsulated with PDA, the release rate, accumulative release rate is much, much lower or it does not open up. The, there is no reaction at acidic and neutral because your PDDA is insensitive at that pH. Now you bring it to pH to 11, we check that we can have a slow release over a period of time. This is for three different inhibitors we tried. One is BTA as a benchmark, turmeric, which is a, which is a green inhibitor, and tartrazine. So we found out that it has a slow release over. It is just direct disposal disperse of these inhibitors. And we checked for the corrosion behavior. We identified that, number one, the left image is one where you say, we can easily say no inhibitor, the potential is more active. As you add inhibitors, you see the potential shifts nobler, which suggests that there is an inhibition action. And as you move, look towards here in this pH 11, uh, 11, we also see the similar effect. That means even when I encapsulate the system Putting the inhibitor into it, it still acts. There is shift in the potentials to a nobler directions. 
And if you look at the same, you can look at the PD diagram. I would like to call you to concentrate at this particular point, which says for pH 11, where you can see for a BTS system, your corrosion rate is 6.09, where when you go to a turmeric system, it is 1.64 microampers per centimeter squared. That says that basically a corrosion rate actually of the metal mild steel. In this case, what we have done, we have, man we have produced this smart material, put it into the dispersed into the solution, put the mild steel and did the study. So it works in the liquid phase. Now, can I put that into a coating? First, I would like to put it in a metallic coating. That means people have learned, or we all know about electrogalvanization process. That means you deposit zinc using the concepts of electroplating. So if I have to electrodeposit or co-electrodeposit an uh, inorganic particle along with the metal, it is very, very tough. You need to play with many forces, and one of the forces is your charges which is developed on the surface. So luckily for us, when we modified this with PDDA, we see the surface charge of these particles. When dispersed in the liquid, you will have approximately positive charges. So by nature, they would tend to go towards the cathode. So when I do electro co deposition of zinc from a zinc bath, dispersing these particles in it, it is possible to disperse or co deposit. This is a surface morphology on the left, which shows of a typical zinc structure. And on the right, when I added PDDA particle of a certain concentration. And is it really, you can see it really on the surface. These are the particles which are present. If I have to say you that, yes, we found it in, then I need to study the cross-sectional image. So what we did, we deposited around approximately 40 microns of zinc layer along with these particles. And then we look at, is really zinc or the silica particles present in the coating? What we did, we zoomed at this part of the coating at the cross-section. And we looked at this with using the EDS imaging. And we found out that if you look at this particular point, it says there is random distribution of silicon and oxygen, which suggests that these particles, which I try to electro co deposit, distributes randomly within the coating. And we could prove that, yes, we are able to random distribute along with the zinc matrix. It is not just on the surface. Now, as I move further, does this perform better with respect to corrosion or not? How do I know? I need to understand what happens at the buried interface. One such tool which is often used is called as the scanning Kelvin probe. How does it work? You will have the surface which is coated with a known model polymer and you will create a defect where you have an electrolyte and you use a sharp gold needle which keeps vibrating using the principle of Kelvin probe. And using this principle, you will be able to measure the corrosion potential and the corrosion potential, if it is intact, it will be nobler and as the coating degrades, as the electrolyte seeps in, you'll see that the potential is no more nobler at the start of the interface. So the x-axis is distance. As the corrosion front progresses, it becomes more activer, and then it's nobler wherever the coating is intact. This is how the principle of SKP works. And what we did, we tried for our zinc coating, which is dispersed with these particles. We compared bare zinc. We compared zinc with 1,000 ppm of these particles. And with 10,000 ppm of particles, what we found, I've gone, given you only a figure for associated with for 1,000 ppm, where we see the delamination rate, which is a function which is plotted between the distance and the time for a zinc PDDA with 1,000 ppm dispersed, gives you a value of 23 micrometers per hour. 23 micrometers per hour, which suggests that for your zinc coating underneath, the progression of corrosion is much faster at 135 micrometer per hour but optimum concentration would be 1,000 ppm of PDDA dispersed, which gives you close to five times lower than what you expect. So to summarize, I think I was able to convince you that we can borrow the science which is available in biology, where they have drug delivery system. It is possible to manipulate systems where you can deliver inhibitors based on demand. I could also prove you that it's not restricted only putting on a polymer system. You can also put it on an metal system where electro core deposition is also feasible and that's what i would like to say to you and i thank you for your kind attention and looking forward for your questions we do have time for just one one question yeah please uh, right now what we have done the study is in the very primitive stage 
what we do is also do the salt spray chamber studies where we look at how the corrosion yeah. progresses that run of the mill experiments are being carried out in a small not in a larger scale coupon in a large scale uh, specimens we do corrosion studies using salt spray chamber we also look at the local scratch parts what does the precipitates or what is the corrosion product therein and that is how we say if i compare between for let's say for 168 hours of test i see that the certain presence of these particles actually retard the zinc dissolution part component thank you thank very you. interesting presentation thank you very much um uh, and we now come to the last talk uh, of this session and with each talk i find that we could actually handle one more talk because they're getting more and more interesting uh, dr chandan srivastava please uh, he, from the materials engineering department of the indian institute of science and he'll be talking about metallic coatings for enhanced corrosion resistance performance can you start you can start you want the mic no it's okay i can speak here so uh, good afternoon uh, my name is chandan shrivastava and this is not projecting so uh thank you very much the first of all organizers for giving me this opportunity so my name is chandan shrivastav i am a professor in the department of materials engineering in isc and we work on metallic coatings for some enhanced corrosion resistance performance one is very special kind of coating today i am going to discuss so uh if you look at the subject of metallic coating then it is used for corrosion protection and what we have there are two hierarchies here one is the morphology of the coating and other is the microstructure of the coating the morphology of the coating is basically connected to the surface defects and cracks and all and that is very highly studied uh, but if you and if your surface defects or cracks are there in the coating then basically you have a very enormously high corrosion behavior but suppose you are able to make a coating which is compact and crack free uh, in in uh, in a th in not in a theoretical sense but in a practical sense then one must look at the microstructure of the coating to understand its corrosion resist corrosion behavior or corrosion rate and when you come to the microstructure then there are several parts which are very very important one is the texture of the coating which is the grain orientation uh, how different grains are oriented on the surface if you have a high energy plane then basically that leads to higher corrosion for example in in an fcc structure 111 is a low energy plane and the other planes are higher energy than the 111 plane if you have grain boundary uh, constitution is very important so there are several kinds of grain boundary one is high angle grain boundary low angle grain boundary csl boundaries and all so people who are metallurgist or if they have done metallography in their uh, undergraduate you do etching you basically take a metallography sample and you do etching to see the microstructure what you actually do is that you corrode the grain boundaries which basically chip which they dissolve and you form a cavity which reflects the light in a different direction and you see a contrast so in in if you are looking at corrosion then the grain boundary constitution is very very important the other important thing is that if if you are looking at coatings which are contain more than one component then you would always have some phases formed and how those phases are distributed in the microstructure whether those phases are at grain boundaries with they are in the grain interior that is also important because that will majorly determine uh, your corrosion behavior based on the extent of galvanic coupling which is happening in the coatings we also look at the strain and strain is something that if you have higher strain and lower strain regions then those can galvanic couple and that can lead to high corrosion behavior so in our lab we study all these parameters and we try to con and connect all these thing to the corrosion behavior currently we are looking at connecting all these parameters to hydrogen permeation in the coating and then connecting hydrogen permeation and corrosion behavior with the microstructure aspect but today i am going to briefly talk to you about one of our uh, some of our work and one is uh, putting graphene and carbon nanotubes in coating it is a area which has now attracted certain attention because graphene is impermeable and it can stop the seepage 
of the corrosive media within the body of the coating and carbon nanotube is hydrophobic and therefore it can lead to repelling the water and it can in some way help in reducing the extent of aqueous corrosion right and so so the corrosion rate people have studied is connected to the amount of additions of cnt and graphene oxide this geo is graphene oxide that you can do what we have done is that we have studied the corrosion resistance behavior or corrosion rate of the coatings as a function of the amount of the additive graphene oxide or carbon nanotube that we put and we have connected that to the microstructure and we have studied this correlation and i'll show you one example to illustrate how this correlation works what and this is a general curve that we obtain in our lab for many many systems what happens is this is a corrosion current density and this is the additive amount and we see that the corrosion resistance first increases with addition of the additive and then after a certain optimum additive the corrosion rate increases very very rapidly high so what happens is that in principle if you take things like graphene oxide or carbon nanotube they are basically carbon so they are cathodic with respect to the metal mostly which in which they are being embedded so if you go to a very high concentration range then the problem here is very high galvanic coupling where carbon is cathode and metal is anode but if you are in this range from starting from here to here then there is something that is important happens and that is the change in the texture of the coating itself and i'll show you that so i'll take the example of a nickel cobalt coating and if people uh, can see that we have a set we have we use electro deposition method to deposit this coating so this is a very traditional method where you use anode and cathode and an electrolyte and this is the bath chemistry um, and the coating that i'm going to talk to talk to you about he here is about 9% cobalt so nickel 9 weight percent cobalt and these are the images of the coating you can see that all these coatings are nearly compact coatings they do not have any major cracks or something and the morphology also remains almost nearly similar and what we are what i'm going to illustrate here this is an x-ray diffraction plot and what you can see that you can see similar kind of peaks here and that says that all these coatings have similar phases and all this so there is a complete dissolution of nickel and cobalt into a single lattice structure which is fcc here and what we also so see that there is not much change in the crystallite size of the coating uh, and this this is a nickel cobalt pure coating and go1 go2 go3 go4 is the addition of different volume fractions of the graphene oxide into this coating so if you look back here we are basically moving in the x axis and what we have produced is the coatings with different amount of go and what we are going to study is the y axis and these are these coatings so this is increasing graphene oxide addition and there is not much change in the uh, morphology or the phase but we see that the i core value has a drop so basically this is for the nickel cobalt coating and if you keep increasing the amount of graphene oxide the the value drops till here and then there is a sudden increase so what we wanted to see is that why is this drop happening here and we did some texture related studies uh, a texture we do by a technique called ebhd people who are not uh, familiar with this technique it is just a way to determine the orientations of grain on the surface and because two grains of different orientation will produce different kind of boundaries between them so we study orientation and subsequently the boundaries that are at the surface and what we see is that this coating the nickel go3 which gives you the best corrosion resistance that gives you the best corrosion resistance and this gives you the worst corrosion resistance nigo6 the coating with the best corrosion resistance has a texture which is basically having a grain boundary constitution which has a largest number of low angle grain boundaries which are low energy boundaries okay and this and this is this is one of the reasons why this coating is basically giving you a higher corrosion resistance because these are different different colors are grains and the boundary between different colors are basically the grain boundaries it is a high energy region where the corrosion basically happens mostly and and the interface between these two colored region if that interface is of lower energy then the corrosion will be lesser very very simple and in this go3 we get the maximum number of those boundaries which are lower energy boundaries so so if we add graphene oxide that pro 
provides a certain kind of impermeability to the coating because the, graph the, the chlorine and the corrosive media cannot penetrate very easily through the graphene oxide. It also changes the texture of the coating. And why this happens? The question is why? So we then we do some kind of a TM. So what we do is that if you see this coating bath and if when the coating is happening, the graphene oxide is dispersed in this electrolyte bath. We took a some amount of graphene oxide from a syringe we take right next to this uh, cathode where the uh, plating is happening we write extract this solution right from here and we see the graphene oxide in the microscope and what we observe is that the graph these are the images of the mapping and what we observed is that the graphene oxide is basically highly rich in nickel so the nominal composition of the coating should be nine percent 9 weight percent cobalt but the graphene oxide that we actually uh, see has a cobalt of only 3 to weight percent so the so before even the so the graphene oxide is going to get coated in the coating it it is in the um, it is in the electrolyte and before it even gets into the coating it is very highly coated with nickel that means that if you take a coating like this a schematic then if this is the graphene oxide region then that region is nickel rich and that simply means that the regions which are in between the, the graphene oxide sheets, they must be cobalt rich because the nominal composition is fixed. Okay, nominal composition, the average composition is fixed. So if this region is nickel rich, then this region has to be cobalt rich. So we now make a control sample. And in, in this control sample, we, in, we don't put graphene oxide, but we make pure nickel cobalt sample with higher amount of cobalt content. And we see that if you increase the cobalt content, the same fraction of the low angle grain boundaries which are, are highly corrosion resistant or, or relatively high higher corrosion resistant boundaries they increase for nickel 20 weight percent cobalt so this tells you that the what has happened now is that people if you see the number of papers which are being published on addition of graphene oxide graphene and carbon nanotubes in metallic coating for corrosion protection those number of papers have increased substantially but they all rely on only on the fact that if you add graphene oxide or graphene, they inhibit the permeation of the corrosive media or carbon nanotube makes it hydrophobic. What we show in our group that in the metal, the, the addition of this carbonaceous additive leads to a compositional, compositional partitioning and that compositional partitioning changes the texture and the grain boundary constitution of the metallic coating itself, which actually leads to an enhanced corrosion resistance behavior. So this is something that I just wanted to show. So this is basically the explanation of what I have seen. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shivas. I'm, I'm sure there must be a couple of questions. Yes? Yeah. yeah. How scalable are these coating in actual application or they are still at the lab level? No, they are very much. See, what happens is the electro deposition is a very scalable. That is the only. What we are simply doing is that we are adding some milligram per liter concentration of graphene oxide in that part. And that's what we are doing. And that so it is just a normal way of coating with little bit addition. So they, they are very much You are right out in some practical installation? Not really. We are right now doing it at the lab scale. <coughs> but, but I know that Tata Steel is, uh, is doing some work in which they are trying to put this graphene containing coating on rows of steel. I have, no, I have not done any answer. Can I? Yeah, we have another question. Yeah, very good presentation, Dr. Srivastava. I just have a question that uh, other than uh, looking at the uh, grain boundary constitution, did you look at the passive uh, uh, film uh, analysis, what actually you are getting on uh, surface? Yes, so, I, I, so what we have done is that, so we have done some work on high entropy, I am telling you high entropy alloy coating, which has several kinds of components and we, which we have added carbon nanotube, we have done some work on that and what we interestingly observe is that whenever you have carbon nanotubes present in the coating and near the surface, the oxides which are formed of the metal are more stable than the oxide, so you, you have taken from different ox oxides of the same metal. So the more stabler oxides are present always in the coatings which have carbon nanotube near them. Why we don't? Compositionally any difference? Sorry? Compositionally? 
Is there any difference with regards to composition of the uh, oxide? See, the relative abundance of the different kind of oxides, okay, when compared to their oxidation state, that is changing. So that, that is, of course, is changing. And the answer to the question is, we don't know. Let's see that. Well, let's thank uh, thank you. I just want to make uh, two observations, if you'll permit me. One is, you know, we've had a delayed uh, session, and uh, in spite of that, we have a full hall. And that shows how much uh, the talks have been appreciated by everybody who's here. Nobody is left here. So thank, <laughs> thank you, all the speakers. And uh, secondly, uh, may I request all of you to... Uh, after the break for tea, there's one last session, and then that is followed by a discussion uh, session. And uh, having deeply apologized to all those speakers whom you know I had to you know, not allow take more questions, perhaps you, you could use that time to interact, and probably it'll be even more um, <coughs> relaxing for you to do so at that time. So thank you very much, and we have a tea break for. 30? 20 minutes, 20 minutes uh, break and back here. I, I have to run away. I have a flight to catch. So uh, I wish I, w I could have stayed back and enjoyed the rest of the workshops. But thank you, Sham. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.